Amen. Now, it's, um, we say Shana Tovah because it's the new year, but you won't find Shana Tovah, you won't find um, Jewish New Year per se in the Bible, but you do find the Feast of Trumpets. And today's message is called the Trumpet of Jesus. And the Feast of Trumpets is mentioned in uh, Numbers chapter 29, verse 1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. A day of blowing the trumpets unto you. Very important to see that. The scripture says blowing the trumpets. And so in the synagogue, we've mentioned, uh, I think on Thursday, that today, uh, when in the synagogue service today and tomorrow, uh, the trumpet is blown over 100 times. There's four different types of trumpet blasts. Uh, four ways to do it. All four are done. And uh, so I, I began to think about this and ask the Lord to speak to me about this. Why is it called the Feast of Trumpets? And of course, you know the trumpet, not a, uh, a horn as we know, but a ram's horn. And uh, what is this significance of it? And he took me to Exodus chapter 19. So turn there with me, Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Turning your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 19. And we're going to begin in verse 14. Exodus 19, verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. So this is symbolic of purification. They washed their clothes. He set them apart. He sanctified them. This is all the people. And he said unto the people, be ready on the third day. Be ready against the third day. Now, the third day, it was the third day, a third, a third day, three-day journey when Abraham found the place to offer Isaac a sacrifice. It was the third day. It was the third day that Jesus rose from the dead. So we know the third day represents sacrifice and represents the Lord. And he says, them, he says to them not to have any intercourse, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people in the camp trembled. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the nether part of the mountain and Mount Sinai was altogether in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook and quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. What a moment. What an exciting moment. And what was this? This was the introduction to the people of Israel to the presence of God. The trumpets signify the presence of God. The, when the trumpet sounded long and loud, that's when Moses and the Lord began to speak. The trumpet signifies not only the presence of God, but the voice of the Lord. The voice of God speaking his will. The presence of God showing his power. That mountain trembled. There was smoke. There was fire. There was an earthquake. Now, all of these things we see throughout the word of God. The presence of God in the fire on the day of Pentecost. The presence of God in the shaking when Paul and Silas were worshiping at midnight and the jail shook and every door opened. The voice of the Lord in the trumpet. I'm going to look also, and you don't need to turn, but there's only one place that any of this is mentioned in the New Testament. Only one place. None of, uh, nothing about the Feast of Trumpets is mentioned. It doesn't say anything about Jesus uh, and the Feast of Trumpets anywhere in the New Testament. But in Acts chapter 27, verse 9, the Day of Atonement is mentioned as the Day of the Fast. Now, this is the beginning today of the 10 days of awe. And it goes from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was mentioned in Acts. That's it. Now, why? My, I would question why 
is there no mention of this? And the reason I believe is in Matthew 24. So I'd like you to go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking, and he tells us a little something. Verse 29, Matthew 24, verse 29. Turn there with me. Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the power of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. The sound of the trumpet signifies the return of the Lord Jesus. The sound of the trumpet, this feast of trumpets, you know, all the feasts of Israel are fulfilled in the New Testament, but trumpets is not because it will be fulfilled at the return of Jesus. There will be the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of the Lord and the presence of God will descend from heaven. He says he'll descend with a shout. We're going to look at all this. And, uh, they shall, and it says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, uh, uh, from, the four winds from one end of, of heaven to the other. We're talking about the rapture of the church here. I don't preach much about the rapture of the church because I want the church to be prepared for the rapture. I want the church to be ready. I want the church to do what we're called to do until the rapture. I don't want us just to be looking to the rapture, holding on by the skin of our teeth till Jesus comes so we can meet him in the air because we are an army of God. We are a people of God. We are called with something to do until he returns. But today we want to talk about his return. The word of God, Jesus himself says there's going to be great tribulation, but after the tribulation. I'm one of those people who believe that the church is not going to go through the tribulation. I believe that there is a, a, a tribulation period which we are going to be going through, but not the tribulation. I believe that the tribulation period we're going to be going through has already begun because we are ostracized as a people of God. We are mocked and belittled. There is something that is called woke. There is something that is changing gender. There is something which is nonsense, which is being promoted by probably about 50% of our population because that's why we have the government that we have. But however, we are the people of God standing on the rock. We shall not be moved. We are going to go through a tribulation, but not the tribulation as I see it. If you'd like to uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll begin there in verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There's a big change coming for you and I. A big change coming. A supernatural change. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We're talking about that trumpet of God once again, and what does that trumpet signify? The presence of God, the power of God, the voice of the Lord, and the gathering of the saints. Israel was gathered together at Mount Sinai. They weren't in their camp. They weren't scattered across the desert. They were gathering at Mount Sinai. That trumpet represents the gathering of the people of God. The Feast of Trumpets is a time of gathering in its fulfillment. Gathering of the saints of God from east and west, even those that have passed away and are dead. They're going to rise up, and we are going to meet the Lord in the air. It says, so when... In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, mortal put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We are going, this is what is technically called the rapture of the church. Rapture doesn't appear anywhere in the word of God. The word rapture, we call it that. And it means a catching away of the saints, a catching away of those saints that are living and a raising up of those that are dead. 
Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians to see a follow-up on this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's start in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord. By, so the Lord gave this to him directly. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend. Okay, so now we're talking about Jesus descending from heaven. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. This is that blowing of the trumpet. This is that gathering of the saints. This is that presence of God. This is when God speaks. This is the voice of the Lord. And he says, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those who have died, those who have passed away, are going to rise in incorruption. They're not going to rise in their mortal bodies. They're going to rise in an incorruptible body. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together. Shall be caught up. Where there's going to be a catching away of the saints of God, the living saints of God. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Those who are alive at the return of Jesus shall suddenly, something's going to happen, and they're going to be caught up and, as well, take on incorruption. Something, that change we read about in 1 Corinthians, there's going to be a change, a physical, spiritual change. We are not just going to rise up with our physical bodies, but we're going to rise up and be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. All of this is going to be taking, taking place simultaneously, but in order. The dead shall rise. Then we're caught up. It's going to happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, so quickly. But we are going to hear the trumpet sound. We're going to hear that trumpet. We're going to be gathered, and we're going to meet Jesus in the air. This is the hope. This is the blessed hope of his appearance that we see in the Word of God. This is the rapture of the church. And it says in the Word of God, in the Bible... Verse 18, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But the time and the season, brethren, you have no need that, I write, need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly well the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. There is nobody that can tell us when the rapture is going to take place. There have been various denominations that have calculated it and predicted it, and they were wrong. We don't know. God knows. He knows. We don't know. So we need to be aware and live doing what we are to do and looking for the rapture. You see, when they built, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in Nehemiah, what did they do? With one hand, they held the sword. With the other hand, they worked at, at the work they were told to do. And we are to work at what we're supposed to do as believers in the earth, but be looking and watching for his return. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, and travail upon a woman with child, they shall not escape. But you, brethren, which are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief, you are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, the sleeping is not being dead, as sometimes the euphemism, they talk about the, the, those that sleep in Christ. This is meaning people who are simply unaware, and not unbelievers, believers who are unaware. There was a recording artist back in the 70s, Keith Green. Keith Green? Keith Green. He did a song that to this day I still remember. It's called Asleep in the Light. Asleep in the Light. And it's all about the church being asleep, even though we're flooded with light, so much light of the Lord, and yet 
we're sleeping through it. We're not getting up and doing the work of the ministry, the work of the Lord. The time is short. You know, as Pastor Ray Beth was talking about Rosh Hashanah, I got this little thing on my phone. And uh, it was a, a something from the Jerusalem Post. I get these warnings about attacks there, you know. And I, I thought, well, maybe there's a rocket attack. No. NASA just announced that there are three asteroids headed toward Earth for Rosh Hashanah. Not that, not that they're going to do anything. You know, it's sensational. It doesn't mean that these are gigantic asteroids. But just think about that. What, nobody knew about it till today? They just announced it today? Did it catch them by surprise? What else is out there that they don't know is going to hit the earth? In a moment, everything changes. In a twinkling of an eye, everything changes for the good. But we need to be ready for that by not hunkering down and waiting and holding on. That's the one who got the talent and hit it in the ground. No, we are to be doing for Jesus, what he calls us to do. Out and about, sowing seed of life into the people around us, sharing our faith, showing his presence and his glory, praying for other people, and expecting miracles to be taking place in answer to prayer. He says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch. That means be awake, be sober. That means be vigilant, be vigilant. We're not talking about somebody who's drunk. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that are, are drunken, are drunken in the night. Let us who are of the day be sober. That is single-minded. That is intellectually minded. Not just, I don't want to say intellectual as versus spiritual. But thinking and seeing what's happening in the world around us. And knowing that we are here to make a difference. We are here to share the truth. We are here to set people free. And he says, putting on the breastplate of faith. What's the first thing he mentions there? Faith. We're a faith church. He's a faith God. The word of faith is in our mouth. We got born again by faith. We have the shield of faith. We are moving mountains by faith. We are laying hands on the sick by faith. We are praying in Jesus' name by faith. His name, through faith in his name, makes us strong, as it made him strong in, in the book of Acts. We are faith people. We need to talk faith, walk faith, be faithful, show faith, demonstrate faith. Let other people know that faith and a faith church and faith people is not a bad word. It is not an evil thing. It is not something that is not of God because God is a God of faith. He is the one who gave us his faith to use. So we are to grow our faith, experience faith, use that faith. When we talk, when we walk, when we pray, faith toward God, faith in his word, faith through the Holy Spirit, building ourselves up in faith as we pray in the Holy Spirit. The first thing he says here is the breastplate of faith. Faith is all important. Tonight I'm going to be talking a little bit about faith because um, 7 o'clock service this evening, we're going to be talking about sailing through life. Sailing through life. I don't want to get ahead of myself and tell you about it, but it's something that the Lord showed me. It's a reinterpretation of something that I have preached over and over and over and over and over. Got lots of revelation on, but he showed me something different about it called sailing through life. Seven o'clock tonight. Online. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Faith works by love, but just think about that. If we don't have the love of God in our hearts, then we could care less about the people that oppose us. We can care less about the people around us. We can care less about those who are unchurched. We can care less about those who hate the church and hate the things of God. But God loves them. He loves the people that are different from us. He loves the people that are hypocrites. He doesn't love their hypocrisy, but he loves them. He loves the people that are confused about their gender. He loves the people that are confused about life itself. He doesn't love what they're into, love what they're doing, but he loves them. And it's that love that will cause us to transcend what we see and reach their hearts with the presence of God. Because unless they give their lives to Christ, they will go through real tribulation. When he returns to take us and catch us away, they will go through a seven years of tribulation. 
But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, what's that about? If we're already saved, what do we need to hope? What are we hoping for? Hope of salvation meaning means everything that goes with it. When we were saved, that was not the end. That was just the beginning. The day we gave our lives to Christ and asked him into our heart to forgive us, that was not the end. It wasn't finished. There are a lot of people who think that's it. Now they just have to hold on until Jesus comes back. Hold on until they make heaven. No, that's just the beginning. That is when we are forgiven. We are cleansed. We are renewed. We are restored. We get a clean heart and clean hands. That's when we get a second birth, the new birth. When we're born then, we have a new identity. We have a new call. We have a new life. We are to start living that life, not holding on to the old life until he returns, but live that new life. It's a life of power. It's a life of joy. It's a life of love. It's a life of miracles. We should be experiencing miracles in our life because Jesus is in our life and he's miraculous risen from the dead. Our faith is not in a religion made by men. Our faith is in a relationship made by God. It's in the fact that Jesus did not stay dead in the tomb, but rose from the dead. If you believe that someone rose from the dead, that's not normal. That's not natural. That's supernatural. That's miraculous. Our very faith is based in the miraculous. Do you think he stopped? Do you think he's finished with his miracles? Some places will tell you that. Some people will tell you that. Well, the miracles were just a dispensation to get the church started. I don't see that in my Bible. I don't know what Bible they're reading. In my Bible, the Holy Spirit came. Doesn't ever tell us when he left. In my Bible, Jesus said, I'm going, but I'm going to send the comforter. He's going to take my place, show you things to come and empower you to do the work of the ministry. I see him telling us that in his name, we'll lay hands on the sick. In his name, we have power. In his name, we cast out devils. In his name, we carry on for him. My Bible says he's the head, we're the body. We are one, working together, doing his will, doing what he came to show us what to do. He demonstrated the word of God. He demonstrated the spirit of God. And then he sent us the spirit and gave us the word to do the same thing miraculously. Miraculously. It's up to us. Now, by the way, when he returns, it's not going to be natural. It's not going to be natural to rise up off the ground and be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's not going to be, certainly not going to be natural to see dead relatives rising up. It's not going to be natural to see dead people coming out of their graves, rising up to meet him. It's going to be something so spectacular. I had a dream one time, and it was, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago. And it was so lifelike. It was, it was amazing. And I don't know if, if this is when this was taking place, but I was riding a horse bareback. It was a white horse. And I was having the time of my life because I'm not, I never rode horses, you know. I mean, I've ridden horses, but I had trouble with horses. They would never do what I wanted them to do. You know, they kept stopping and eating. And everyone else's horse, they're, and I'd keep pulling on it. So that horse, he rubbed me off on a tree. He went to a tree and rubbed my leg on the tree till I fell off. I mean, he, he, knew, what to, he knew how to get rid of me. So I've never, I've never learned about horses. Anyway, in this dream, what's that? Yeah. Oh, he also reached around and tried to bite me, too. I didn't know they could turn their neck like that. It was like the exorcist there turned his head right around. So uh, I'm, in the, I'm in this dream, and I'm riding this horse, and I'm having the time of my life. I'm laughing, and I'm smiling, and I have perfect control, and I'm in the air. I'm not on the ground. I'm in the air, and there's thousands and thousands of people around me riding horses, and we're following this bright light on a horse, and we're, the horses are going like this in the air, almost like, you know, Santa's reindeer, if, you, if, you, if you're into that, and I mean, just leaping through the air, and suddenly I see we're coming at supersonic speed toward a planet. It's Earth. And I woke up right after I recognized Earth. Now, 
it was the only thing I don't want to interpret that to say, well, I'm going to be dead and I'm going to come back with him because I don't know. I'm thinking maybe that's when we're coming back after the rapture. But here's the thing. There, I've never experienced the joy that I had in that dream. It was something beyond comprehension. I've never had a dream like that before that or since then. I know that must have been what it's going to be like when we return with Jesus, following Jesus. So this is something that is so supernatural, so out there, so miraculous, but so fun. We are not going to be bemoaning those who don't believe at that moment of rapture. We are going to be so caught up with the joy of the Lord. It is going to be something that we've never, ever experienced before. So get ready. It's coming. Get ready. He's coming. Get, now, how do we get ready? Moving in the miraculous. Doing the miraculous. Simply doing what Jesus tells us to do. Laboring at the ministry, but keeping our eyes looking up for his appearing. Because he's definitely coming back. I can't say he's coming back now. There are a lot of things that, that, that he said are going to be happening. And I'm not going to be looking, you know, and... Actually, there was a book in 1988, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Was Going to Come Back. Remember that book? Anybody remember that book? 88 Reasons? Remember that book? And uh, he didn't come back, though, did he? No. So 88, 88 Reasons Why He Was Going to Come Back in 1988, I think. And I was going to write a book, 89 Reasons, you know, and the la I'll just use his reasons. And the last one was like, because he didn't come back. I don't know. But I, you can't write a book like that. You can't say he's coming back at this time or that time. Now, I will say, though, that I know someone who's born again, who got born again because of that book, and to this day is still a believer. So books like that do serve a purpose because that, that man gave his life to the Lord because he believed Jesus was coming back in 1988. And even though he didn't, he's still serving God today. So praise God for that. But anyway, for us, don't be deceived. Somebody online tells you they know it, they get a date, they're going to, no, don't be deceived. Nobody, I don't care how enlightened, how prophetic they are, nobody knows, nobody will know, but God. But when it happens, we're all going to know. So let's just hold fast until we see him in Jesus' name. That's what this day, this Rosh Hashanah, because it's the new year. It's going to be a new phase of our lives, the eternal begins that day 